Initiating, managing and implementing change is one of the hardest challenges for any leader. How do you get buy-in? And what can leaders do to help their organizations embrace change? Welcome to a special edition of The Big Question, the monthly video series from Chicago Booth Review. We're filming in front of a studio audience at the Gleacher Center in downtown Chicago as part of a panel hosted by the Harry Davis Center for Leadership at Chicago Booth. I'm Hal Weitzman, and with me to discuss the issue is an expert panel. Harry Davis is the Roger L. and Rachel M. Getz Distinguished Service Professor of Creative Management at Chicago Booth. Fred Hochberg is the former chairman and president of the Export-Import Bank of the United States, where he was the longest serving chairman in the agency's history, serving for eight years. Jenny McCulloch is Director of Sustainability Strategy, Engagement and Business Integration at McDonald's Corporation. And Ashley Wheater has been Artistic Director of the Joffrey Ballet for the past decade. In 2016, he helped the ballet break with tradition by introducing a new production of The Nutcracker, set in 19th century Chicago. Panel, welcome to The Big Question. Harry Davis, let me start with you. Why is change so hard? Interestingly, it's an interesting question given that I've been at the same institution for over a half century. <laughs> so maybe I have no credibility whatsoever to talk about change. But I, I think that it, my, my sense is that leaders face a, a, a real challenge of both deciding what should change and also what should not change. And to me, that is one of the great challenges of leadership. Okay. Fred Hochberg, does that sound like the, the right description? Yes, and I think you have to find that balance between introducing change at a rate of speed an organization can handle it. If you go too slow, you lose momentum. If you go too fast, you lose everybody. Okay, so how do you balance those two? Um, it's an art, it's not a science. You have to sort of see how people are absorbing it. And I would say, the other thing I think about frequently, whether, and I've been in the public sector, the private sector, nonprofit, and even the academy. The academy is the hardest. I say that. <laughs> um, you really have to be engaged in implementation because that's the way you get feedback and determine if change is being absorbed and not being absorbed, whether you can accelerate the pace or need to slow down. So, so. does that mean as a, as a change leader, it's best to identify some early wins? You need some early wins because that builds momentum. And you can't just be involved in writing a strategy and then just say, okay, now you take care of it because people will not necessarily understand the whole nuance in the framework. So only by being involved in implementation do you really see it happening and ensure that it happens and you get the feedback to make mid-course corrections, which if you don't do, you will actually not have a very good outcome. Okay, Jenny McCall, let me bring you in because you've been involved in vast global change at McDonald's, this global organization, big kind of uh, fundamental changes in the way that the, that the company sources um, its product and the mindset. Uh, what are the kind of the big challenges that you faced? I think what we're seeing uh, in the food system is a lot of changing consumer expectations about where their food comes from and understanding that better. And when we're dealing with a system at the scale of McDonald's, figuring out the right way to tell those stories and share a vision of, of an evolution towards more sustainable sourcing practices involves really clear global visionary uh, sort of leadership perspective, but then also creating the environment where those local best practices can emerge and finding ways to share those among practitioners and really help bring those to life and, and scale them. And just remind us what it, exactly what it is, what is the change that you're trying to bring at McDonald's? So we're, we're looking at um, aspirations globally to source all of our food and packaging sustainability, uh, sustainably. But probably the biggest change that we're driving right now is, is a global movement on beef sustainability. As a burger company, looking at the challenges facing food production in the world today and the impacts of beef production, uh, it's, it's our responsibility but also our opportunity in our sector to really help push the industry and bring together um, all the different players involved who have that shared vision of a robust and healthy food system and beef industry and planet. So. And, so, and so how have you managed that trade-off that Fred spoke about between getting momentum and getting buy-in. Sure, so I, I think that, that, that piece that you mentioned ar around celebrating those small wins and just getting going with pilots and practices that we can then celebrate and share and, and figure out which ones we can scale is really important. I think if you let perfect get in the way of progress and, and just moving forward, 
you'll never move anywhere. And so we take a very deliberate approach to lay out what that global vision is holistically, but then also really just enable our different country teams and supplier best practices to just move forward and then adjust course as we need to, uh, but not let, let that one concept of the vision of where we're headed get in the way of, of making progress and then letting it adjust course as we go. Okay, Ashley Wheater, you were involved in a different kind of change, changing a tradition of the nutcracker to a different kind of nutcracker. What were some of the, uh, what were some of the resistance that you faced in doing that? Do you know, I think that um, you know, it, go, it kind of goes back to before, to 2007, and looking at the organization of the Joffrey Ballet and seeing what was the internal structure there, what did the picture look like, um, how did that picture need to shift, um, where are the arts today, what, how do we engage, how do we become, how do we remain relevant to our art form, and so um, there was a little bit of resistance, but I would say not a huge amount. But it and sounds I, like you went back to basics and, and talked about some big questions that you could address about where the company was at that particular moment right. in the larger art scene. Absolutely. And it was really like there was, a, there was a plan to getting to wanting to produce a new Nutcracker. And uh, you know, for, for any ballet company, the Nutcracker is our largest um, revenue source um, of, our, of our budget. So to get it right is really important. Um, there, are, there are hundreds of nutcrackers out there that are all pretty much the same. Um, but we felt that we wanted to invest in our city, um, setting it here in Chicago during the Columbian Exhibition, and, and taking just a very different idea about, about what, does it, what does it really mean to the people that want to come and see it, what does it mean in terms of looking at the art form and moving the art form forward? It sounds like you had to do a little bit of problem construction because superficially everything is going very well. There's no problem that you're trying to fix, but you're sort of putting the production in a bigger context. I, right. And sort of in that in, in itself necessitates change, is that? Is that right? Well, I think that you know, every, every production has its has its day and it where you know scenery and costumes are, are real things. Um, costumes are our working clothes and they wear out. And so if you're going to spend you know two million, three million dollars uh, reproducing the exact same thing, even though we've moved on 25 plus years, um, would it not be a great idea to say, well what does it look like if we take another million dollars and completely redo the work? And so it really came down to what did we really want to do? Was it, you know, for me, the, the version that we had before, I had been involved with, with that in 1987. So knowing that production really well and thinking, can we do something that's more thoughtful, more engaging, um, uh, and that, that has a, a future generation that can engage with a new production, seem to me really the, the right way to go. Okay, now there are two questions that have come in from our, from our audience here at the Gleacher Center that are both related to people in organizations who are resisting change. Do the panelists have any views on uh, the challenges with change? Many people don't want change. How do you deal with those in organizations who resist change? Fred Hochberg, mm -hmm. how, how did you, because I mean, you came from the government sector, not, 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 an organize, not a, kind of an organization known for its uh, embrace of change. So how, how, would you, how did you deal with that? Uh, well, you need a lot of patience, but not too much. And um, there, I remember there were some people uh, at the Export Import Bank uh, who I had to say, well, listen, if you don't want to change, perhaps this is no longer the organization for you. Now, that's kind of the last thing you get to. Um, but people have to know that you'll go there. And I think also, at least in government, one of the hard things, I, I did serve at the Export Input Bank for eight years, and the typical uh, political appointee, and I was appointed by President Obama, serves maybe 18 months. So it's very hard to affect change if you're only there 18 months, because as soon as you arrive, people look at their watch and they know you're gonna be leaving soon, and they'll wait you out. Right. So partly, you need enough endurance and enough uh, saying power that people realize you're not going to go away, the request for change is not going to go away, um, and you also need some urgency. You know, in the commercial world, the urgency is far more real because 
if McDonald's not doing it, I'll go to Burger King. Uh, <laughs> or Wendy's. Or Wendy's. Uh, and, you know, and if I'm not going to go to the Joffrey, maybe I'll see a play, maybe I'll see another dance company. But in the government, frequently, and government employees have a sense, well, where are they going to go if they don't come to us? So I think that it's harder to sometimes have the urgency in a government setting, mm -hmm. and the, the academy as well. I, I was going to say, Harry Davis, you've been a attempting to <laughs> and occasionally successfully implementing change in academic environment, uh, also known for its resistance to change. How yeah, do you it, deal with you that know, resistance? You, you can't say goodbye to a tenured member of the faculty, so <clears throat> that's, a, that's a constraint that one has to deal with. But I, I think the way, the way I tend to look at this is, uh, is there in the culture a, a sort of predisposition for experimentation, to just trying things? And that works actually quite well with scientists, because if you say, well, let's try something and we'll collect some data, that's often very compelling. And I, as you were talking, Ashley, I was thinking about the, the, the notion of the nutcracker is, is obviously a very important experiment. You wouldn't yeah. probably call it an experiment. But, it, but you, have other, you have other options. Yeah. And therefore, it's a, wonderful, it's, it's a wonderful way to try something, which isn't probably going to either kill the organization or it, it might move it up to another level. So I, I, I'm a big believer in, in the kind of conversation that you have with people and to say, we're going to try something, we're going to learn whether it works or not as we thought it would work, something is going to come out of it that's going to be very helpful for the organization. And I have found that to be a quite compelling uh, rationale to generate a willingness to try things. I, I think also, as I listen to and I think about the Joffrey, Frankly, being an authentic leader, if people really believe that you really care about the institution, mm -hmm. frequently the most resistant of people who've been there perhaps a long time and really are sort of engaged in the institution. So if there's a sense that you're really part of that institution and want to see that institution flourish, and it's for the institute, not just for yourself, that is a way of winning over a number of people. And I would also say an example in our, in our context at McDonald's, we have thousands of restaurants worldwide and thousands of independent franchisees who operate those restaurants. And so when it comes to innovation and sustainability, it's often um, an opportunity to build on your point where we can pilot and test mm -hmm. new practices in certain restaurants among yeah. those who are maybe a little bit more willing to try something new right. and then um, figure out how to position those influential sort of first mover leaders in a way where they can influence their peers much more effectively than we as the corporation can. And so finding those kind of influential leaders within a community that you're trying to shift can end up helping kind of build a movement towards a change rather than just having a top-down approach, um, which becomes quite effective. OK, another question from our audience um, about sort of managing the change. When can you let others navigate a course that you have set? How long should you oversee a change that you have initiated? Fred Hochberg, do you have a thought on that? There's no, I mean, there's no precise time. I think that what you really need, you need to get enough people who will uh, sort of carry the message and begin to internalize it so that they don't have to read a strategic plan, but they begin to understand internally what it is you're trying to do. I mean, to be specific, one of the goals I had when I joined Exim Bank was to make us more customer oriented, more commercial, more fitting the needs of exporters, less just following the more typical government requirements. And not to say we didn't follow the requirements, but I'll give you a, quick, a little example. When I got to Exim Bank, we had transactions that we were underwriting that I learned were as long as 1,800 days old. And so one department didn't agree, and they would say, well, I can't agree. Well, well let's talk about it in a month or two. And they just sat there. And I got a call one day from a large exporter that says, uh, we have a transaction that's 525 days old. So I just said, OK, anything over 100 days, I want to see every Monday morning. Well, that sent shockwaves through the organization. and. I remember one manager said to me, well, I don't want you to look at that. I'm going to look at it and make sure I see him at 75 days. I said, exactly. I don't want to look at them either. So partly, it that was an external force. Uh, and you have to find a couple of people who will sort of carry the, carry the mission and become um, 
carry the values of the organization and find people that internalize. And the only way I go back to this happens is you have to authentically believe in what you're doing. Because I'm sure there were people at McDonald's that go, oh, come on, we're just in the burger business. You know, this is a lot of fancy pants millennial stuff. Why do we have to deal with this? I'm sure there were people who have that. So you really need to find enough people who will buy into it and then carry the mission. Yeah, I think that's crucial. Absolutely. Um, Ashley, this sounds like one that would be good for you. How do you sell change that may not have a quantifiable ROI, return on investment? <laughs> if you, like what I feel about kind of the Joffrey Ballet today is that um, we are, a, uh, you know, one of Chicago's major arts institutions. I think that we have um, earned our respect of the city. I think that we have seen that um, by the quality that we are producing um, on the stage and in our academy and right throughout the community is that um, we've seen our, our ticket sales and our subscriptions continually go up. So we've never in the last 10 years seen anything go down or flat. So when you want to make change, it's a really good barometer of what could happen next. But I'm happy to say um, that it keeps going up. Yeah, and another, another way we think about that is um, in sustainability, a lot of times the ROI isn't short term. It's, it's sort of a long term investment in the resiliency of our system. So I think being able to shift gears between the types of value that we talk about that we're delivering, you know, sometimes it is quantitative and financial. Sometimes it's risk management. Sometimes it's regulatory management. Sometimes it's painting that picture of the macro context of consumer trends and just knowing that to stay relevant as a brand, we need to be meeting those future expectations of customers. And so I've, I've found that um, when, we, when we paint a more holistic picture of what that value is and that long-term value, um, those short-term ROI, simple payback conversations become less important. They're always going to be important, um, but looking at things as a long-term investment. Interesting. Success. So you don't try and quantify the dollar effect of sustainability? The, uh, we, we certainly do when we can. It's, it's very hard to do in some cases. Um, certain things like investments in energy efficiency or um, commodity cost volatility are easier to quantify. Uh, whereas longer term things like forest protection and climate resiliency and agriculture, it's a bit more uh, complex and dynamic. So we sort of try and paint a, as quantified a picture as we can, but then also acknowledge those qualitative value factors. Too. I was just going to add, there's nothing better than an external threat. <laughs> Whether it's people are going to get tired of that nutcracker and you're going to spend all that money and it's going to be the same. You have to say, I've already seen that one. Or whether your competition is doing it, or in our mm -hmm. case, congressional or foreign competition. Right. You know, we were competing against 90 other export credit agencies in the other world. So there's nothing like an external threat to get everybody uh, focused. Mm -hmm. uh, it's easier in the, in the commercial world, but it's true in any environment. That's though. interesting. Did you, Ashley, at the, at the ballet, did you feel that there was an external threat, or was it just that it sort of, well, as I, you described it, it's had its day? I think that we are constantly with an external threat because the arts, you know, we're, totally. <laughs> we're always having to sing for our supper. And, um, and funding for the arts We're has changed. We're dancing for the <laughs> So I think that it, it's constantly, it's always there. Like every single time we perform, you know, is it, is it, are we going to succeed? Okay. Uh, Jenny McCulloch, how does an organization determine its ability to absorb change? And then how do you gauge it along the way? You're involved in, a, in this very long multi year process. Um, you know, is there a danger of change fatigue? You know, I think when it comes to change at the scale that we're dealing with at McDonald's, um, because of the pace being a bit more measured and, and I guess maybe slow is just a more blunt way of saying that, um, you know, it, it is such a long transition and a journey that we're on um, that I, I think for any one particular initiative, it takes so much momentum to get everything moving that um, usually there's a lot of excitement for that once we get it going. Um, I do think it means that we have to prioritize where we're going to be pushing the biggest changes and the boldest, the boldest actions. So for us, you know, in the case of McDonald's, you know, we're a burger company at heart, so it makes sense to a lot of people that beef would be an area where we're trying to help drive change at a higher level than some of the other th commodities that we source. 
uh, but really we're, we're working to kind of move the whole, the whole boat, as it were. Um, so I think you can scale the, the level of change that you strive for based on sort of where the appetite is. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been a good transition so far, but I think, you know, time will tell. Yeah. It's not I mean, over the, the, by any means. <laughs> there's a question there, isn't there, about your, you know, your political or leadership capital and where you spend it. Did you feel, Ashley, that at the job for you, could they go through another similar experiment with, uh, with another, I guess there isn't really an equivalent of the nutcracker, is there? But could they go through another big change and sustain it? Well, we could ruin Swan Lake. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I knew, you'd, I knew you'd help I, me think of an won't. example. Um, do you know, I think, I mean, I, I think that the thing about, about uh, particularly the Joffrey, because it, when you compare us to the, the, the rest of the country and, and the other companies that were in the same league with the New York City Ballet or San Francisco Ballet, or, you know, their budgets compared to the Joffrey's budget are two to three times the size. So we, we are a nimble company. And so turning that boat around is doable. It's not going to take as long as it would take some of these organizations that have you know, a, a deeper, longer kind of infrastructure that, that isn't able to necessarily be more flexible. So I would, I, what I, what I be hope, believe and what I hope is that you know, as we look to the future, that what we leave in place will, will be really good um, values that anybody would look at them and say, this was really well done. This was really well thought out. And why would we mess with this? But we can learn from that. And we can take that. And we can you know, add to it. Mm -hmm. OK. But how do you balance that, though, with experimenting, Harry Davis? Because if you, if you experiment and it goes wrong, you might say, great, we did an experiment. You know, we learned from that. But it, it, it might also create a counterculture that against change. Well, I think that uh, I, sometimes uh, I've been encouraging students to experiment. And they say, well, what happens if it doesn't turn out? And then my response is, then you're not experimenting. I mean, a lot of experiments don't turn out as you expected. And I, I think the notion, I suppose, in, in a business context is if you can create an environment where there's a lot of <coughs> relatively low-risk experiments taking place, where, where quite, quite apart from was it successful or unsuccessful, whatever the outcome is, it's, it, it, it's a basis for discussion and dialogue not just with oneself, oh, I think that's important, but also with other people. So I, I think that, uh, I, I think this sort of fear of failure uh, gets in the way of, of change. Because, you know, you, you learn things by, you know, I've, I've failed many times, but every time I've done it, I, I, I say, okay, I'm gonna retire, and then I wake up in the morning, and I say, you know, I, I could fix it and do something different. <laughs> so I'm still at it. Well, I think you're right. I mean, and you have to find a way. I mean, we don't look for failure, but having run a bank, if we don't have a few bad debts, then we're not making enough loans, yeah. we're not taking enough risk. And if we don't try some new financial products, and if they don't work, then when, you know, and I would say, let's talk, listen, we tried these eight things. These three turn out to be duds. We're either too early to the market, too late to the market, or missed the market, or whatever, uh, or priced it wrong. But then, we're going to move on and try something else. And you just kind of reward those that win. You sort of push aside those that don't, but make it OK that no one's going to lose their job just because they tried something that didn't work out. OK. And Jenny McCulloch, I'm going to come back to you for the next question, because you talked about uh, experimenting and failing. So somebody's asked, what's an example of a fail? And then maybe you can give us some analysis of why you failed. What did you do wrong? Um, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll use a personal example in the, in the sustainability world at McDonald's. We, a couple years ago, were working on trying to build up a platform for how we could help our franchisees to identify and then invest in energy efficiency and water efficiency um, technologies in their restaurants because there's a lot of you know, cost savings involved. There's a lot of you know, environmental benefits that we could do. And you know, we, we tried designing a platform in a way that we thought would be really effective and easy. And we involved a lot of franchisees in, in testing it out and helping develop it. But the truth of the matter was we launched it at a time when there was just so many other initiatives coming down across the business that the timing was, was off. And, and maybe it wasn't as simple and easy as we thought it was uh, from, from our perspective. 
And so, you know, on one hand, we could view that as a failure because it wasn't really adopted and, and took off the way that we had hoped that it would. Uh, but then on the other hand, we learned a lot from what aspects of it were the, were the sticking points. And now we're sort of weaving those into, okay, what's the next generation of, of how we work with, with our franchisees to really invest and find those, those opportunities. And if you're not willing to at least try something and then, you know, see if it's going to go somewhere. Um, you won't glean those insights that can help make the next iteration of it a lot stronger. Mm -hmm. So we're very excited for the future of that. Yeah. Harry, I'm guessing you have a thought on whether it's really failing at all or just learning from different kinds of results. Yeah, we, you know, we, we talk a lot uh, in Chicago about the development of what we call insight skills, which is the ability to learn the right lessons from our experiences. And it's not easy because many of the environments that we work with are not receptive to and, and really set the stage for learning the right lessons. Uh, we have a colleague who talks about sort of, sort of safe environments and also wicked environments. And often the feedback is delayed, it's, it's coming, it says more about the person giving the feedback. So the notion of, of really developing the discipline to learn, learn the right lessons I think is, is, an, is a very important issue for leadership. I was thinking, listening to both, we had we had two products at the Exponential Bank that were failures. Uh, one was, more than two, but two I can think about quickly. One was called uh, Export Express. They were sort of, tried to do a fast turnaround loan within, the goal was within three to seven days max. And they were for loan amounts of maybe up to, I think, $50,000. Um, and because banks can open, you can do a mail-in application and get a loan, and the interest rates are higher, and the write-offs are higher, but the net is still good. The problem is the federal government is so uh, allergic to a write-off, even if you say, well, we're collecting fees of 10% and the write-offs of 5%, so we're still ahead. Um, all the people says, look at your write-off rate. You you, obviously, this is bad underwriting. So there were so many... Um, safeguards put in that the fast express was really not anywhere near so it wasn't express. it wasn't the speed of the approval it was the it was the nature of the well loan. well we had to put in so many safeguards that we were no longer giving an express product <laughs> <laughs> we could still be express compared to typical federal government uh, uh, yes speed. but ultimately and we just and, and the and the fees were so high because of that and the legal fees that i said this is just this product is not delivering one of these, we got rid of it. And we had another product, uh, supply chain finance, because we were concerned in the financial crisis about suppliers that were having elongated terms from companies that instead of paying in 30 days, they were paying in 90 or 120 days, and how do the small businesses survive? Well, it took so long to get that through the federal process and to get approvals and so forth. By that point, interest rates had dropped so much that the product really didn't really have a reason for being. so. Part of it was timing and part of it was just the sort of, there is a certain clumsiness in the federal process that didn't really enable it. I think what, you know, your, your story uh, also reminds me of the fact that my experience is that organizations don't have historians that have accurate memories about these experiences. Often it gets personalized. Well, you know, it was Fred who, Came up there. with that crazy idea. And, and so we're not learning the right lessons. And, and often we don't go back far enough to realize that maybe 20 years ago there was a ballet that Joffrey tried, and, but who remembers it? And right. what, what do we sort of hold on to that mm -hmm. would be really valuable? And I think also that we, you know, somehow we're afraid to step up and say, are we making a mistake here? Or is your idea making, is, is it good for us or not good for us? And I, and I have witnessed like, the, great, the greatest ingredients that should have been a huge success, and it really was a major disaster. And so, you know, within seeing that process fall apart, but still going through with a multi, multi million dollar production, and knowing that you get to that opening night, and it's a bomb. But you saw it coming, but nobody was able to have the conversation to say, this is a real concern for me. And I don't know why, you know, it's something that I learned from this lesson. So I'm very hands-on about having that conversation. If, if for me, it's telling me, like, wake up, listen, and, and act. Okay, nice question related to our 
recent uh, Nobel uh, laureate at, uh, at Chicago Booth, Richard Thaler, who famously wrote, co-wrote the book Nudge. Um, so this would be a good one for you, Fred. Ha have any of the panelists nudged organizational change? So just to remind ourselves, nudging is about changing the environment in such a way that people behave differently. So you talk, for example, about setting the, the new 100-day deadline. What were some of the other nudges you put in place? Well, we, we actually, uh, as a federal agency, when the, uh, after the financial crisis, there was a stimulus bill that came out, which quote unquote was shovel ready, which in America we don't really have things that are shovel ready because we don't like to plan. Um, but our, our building had been planned to be renovated for many years, so we were slated and we had to commit all the funds immediately. And one of the things I looked at as running a federal agency, you know, there are the factors are uh, personnel, uh, technology, uh, travel, uh, and space. And partly nudging the organization to say, you know, nobody wants to give up their large offices and their private offices and bathrooms and everything else, but what would you, what, what, what would you like to give up? You don't want it, you want more staff, everybody wants more travel, everybody wants newer IT equipment and laptops and iPhones, so let's reduce the space per square foot per person. So we went from an average of like 400 feet per person down to about 150, much closer to the private sector. Uh, that was not such a oh, welcome change. <laughs> so it took a lot of nudging. I made uh, and well, what, what were some of the nudges you got to, go, to, uh, to get people Well, to I found it? a few departments that really liked the idea and they wanted to be compact together so that they agreed to it. And over time, other departments said, you know, I, 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 instead of having my people on another floor, let's all pull in together. Um, so little by little that nudging, but you had to find one or two people who would sort of say, yeah, I'll take the chance. Who would I'll. be the ambassadors for your idea. Right, and okay. carry that culture forward. How do you nudge people in the, you know, you've got so many stakeholders at McDonald's. How do you kind of nudge them, build the, the environment so that they will come along with you? I think a, an example from McDonald's would be um, looking at the Happy Meal offering and in the past, um, you, you may not know this, but all, all Happy Meals now have a side serving of fruit in them by default, but that wasn't always the case. And that transition to on the menu board offerings make it a default choice that you had to opt out of as opposed to opt into mm -hmm. automatically um, got a lot more fruit into you know, families and kids than would have otherwise maybe happened organically from a brand like McDonald's and you know all of a sudden we've had over two billion servings of fruit to kids just in the US over the last several years so it's it's little things like that where it's um, you know we have we have maybe some of our customers asking for something but not all of them um, and we can see where a trend is going and then kind of make a choice with the way we offer our products that then helps bring on uh, the rest of the journey classic default okay wonderful well Unfortunately, our time has run out. It's been a fascinating discussion. Uh, my thanks to our panel, Harry Davis, Fred Hochberg, Jenny McCulloch, and Ashley Weeter, and also my thanks to our audience here at the Gleacher Center in downtown Chicago. For more research, analysis, and commentary, visit us online at review.chicagobooth.edu, and join us again next time for another Big Question. Goodbye.